Welcome to Classics You Slept Through. We are the book podcast where we read and discuss classic books. I'm your host, Kyle Davis, along with a girl who does not live her life in eight-minute increments, but will tonight, my sister, Meredith. How's it going, Mare? <laughs> eight-minute increments, I'm ready. Yeah, eight-minute increments. That's the goal, folks, because we have six, yeah, six stories to get through today for our last part of Men Without Women. Um, if you were not listening prior, Men Without Women, short story collection by Ernest Hemingway. I believe it was his second um, co- sec- uh, section, bleh, second <laughs> collected works, uh, second book. Can't talk tonight. Uh, but we have six of them to get through. And so not to completely bore you or blow up your podcast feed completely, we're going to try to do these eight minutes each. I've got a stopwatch ready to go. We're going to see how this goes. He's anyway, serious. I am You are dead serious, serious, folks. Very, this is professional podcasting, folks. All right, so uh, here we go. Our first story is called Canary for One, and it follows an American couple in um, France uh, on a train, and they meet a, another woman traveling, and she's got a canary, which she has bought for her daughter, and she's bringing it home to her. And it uh, goes into... They just sort of start chatting, um, like you do as you meet people as you're traveling. Sure. We all, you know, relatable experience. A hundred years later, we've all been on a plane and sat next to somebody that strikes up a conversation, and you either, you know, put your headphones on so you don't have to talk, <laughs> or you maybe make a connection and meet someone and network a little bit, and or just maybe have a fun, interesting conversation uh, on a plane. Or you accidentally talk about politics. And regret every moment. Uh, I would not recommend doing that. No. You know. uh, but I feel like this is almost the equivalent. I it's mean, close. It's, it's close. It borders, yeah. It's uncomfortable conversations. So as we get into this, the woman they meet, the who they just refer to as the American woman, uh, and turns out she's a little hard of hearing, uh, so she sort of, I guess, repeats herself. And, and I can imagine... She's probably speaking very loudly and maybe causing a scene on this European train. As Americans do. As we do. And um, she has some very, uh, shall we say, solid opinions on foreigners. Uh, So as they're traveling. She has some solid opinions on American men, for sure. Well, definitely. Which is the point of the story, as as we will see. Uh, but she's um, just an interesting woman. I, I I think the story kind of describes her. I wouldn't imagine that she's much older, you know, in 1923, 4, 5, when this was written. I, I'm assuming she's probably in her mid-40s. I think it says she's middle-aged or something, like in her 40s, if I remember correctly. You know, but as I'm reading this, I'm... I just found this interesting, you know, as a personal reflection. I'm picturing her, like, in her 60s, maybe, or 70s, even. Um, but I don't think she's actually that yeah, old. Yeah, I was totally picturing like mom, like um, <laughs> like someone because I mean the hard of hearing thing, right? And right. Chatting up strangers, like exactly. Mom doesn't necessarily chat up strangers about big topics, but she is like a magnet for people to yes. speak to her. And I don't think she does anything just, but she's just got that like welcoming. Like anyone comes up to her and talks to her. Well, we that need to, to engage, right? I don't, I don't know. I don't see her doing anything necessarily. I mean, she does sometimes, but like we were just at the theater on Wednesday, last Wednesday, and I saw her coming back to our seats from far off. She was just standing, not doing anything. And then another woman came up the stairs. And I'm like, that, that lady's going to talk to mom. I know she is. <laughs> and she did. She like she did. made a line for mom and wanted to there talk to go. her. I don't, but anyway, there that's who I was picturing. Yes. And I, I, well, I picture this woman as starting the conversation. Like she's traveling alone. Yeah. You know, she sees another uh, set of Americans. Uh, she starts talking to them. Well, she thought the one was British. Right. Well, I guess maybe he thought been, he was British. Right. I guess maybe he'd been speaking a British accent. Uh, these are definitely, so the, the narrator and his wife are definitely an expat couple. They live overseas. Yes. Um, and so I imagine they've probably taken on some. Uh, verbal affectations of living overseas. Um, And the guy's kind of playful a little bit. He almost says, well, I almost wanted to say bracers, uh, but I changed to suspenders, so that way I I didn't, like, kind of mess with her. Nah, I'm I'm an American. 
Well, this woman, um, she tells a story, basically. Uh, she's bringing this, this canary home to her daughter, but uh, to kind of cheer her up, because she has made her daughter break up with her fiancé, who apparently was a Swiss man, and mm-hmm. this woman was very um, set against her marrying a Swiss man, even though, you know, he comes from a good family, he's an engineer, you know, probably good prospects, uh, but she, like, no, American women have to marry American men, because uh, those are the only appropriate men to take care of an American woman. So she, even though this woman obviously lives overseas as well. Nobody makes a good husband like an American man. No, they make the best husbands. They make the best husbands. husbands. I mean, I'm 50-50 so far. (laughs) Yeah, I will. (laughs) I got one winner. Yeah. No offense, but the other one didn't work out. (laughs) Uh, He's working out great. I I will withhold my opinions on uh, (laughs) my own ability. But uh, but But yes. This woman has strong, strong opinions. Exactly. And, and then they, and they, they, they end up, they talk a little more, and it turns out that this Swiss guy uh, was from Vevey, and uh, the couple knows Vevey well because they honeymooned, honeymooned there. there. Yeah, and actually, I think, stayed in the same hotel as the American woman. You know, great, nice hotel, which I can imagine back in those days, there probably weren't that many hotels. You know, it's not like there's a Holiday Inn Express on every exit on the freeway. You know, so the so the, the, the fact that these two Americans end up at the same hotel is probably not that shocking. Uh, so anyway, so they go through and they kind of talk and they chat and, um, you know, they finally get to the, the station, to their destination. Uh, I think where they, yeah, they're getting back to Paris and, you know, the, they get off the train. There's a porter there to, to pick up the bags and, you know, you just read the story and then the last line comes and after this, this wonderful exchange, and they're all hanging on the train, he says, the, the narrator says, we were returning to Paris to set up separate residences. And I don't know, that line just hit like a gut punch good. at the end of the story. Yeah. It was good. I mean, what I thought was so interesting about this story, especially upon reading it again, was that sh- this woman's so set on American men and American husbands, so much so that she's mi- she, she knows her, her daughter was madly in love with this person who they praise up and down. He's got all these good qualities. They praise the country, the land, everything they're praising is not American. Like she gets all of her clothes handmade from France and sent to her special, everything is praised and none of it is American, except you have to have an American husband. husband. It's been two years. She's bringing this canary and this poor girl is still apparently distraught. Right. She needs a canary. Um, (laughs) So that'll do it. <laughs> yes. And then the last line, you know, this American husband and wife, they're going to live separately. And the other thing is that this woman, this American woman, like thinks the plane's going to, or the plane, the train is going to crash the whole time. Right. She's awake all night, worried about it. Then they see a, a train crash or they're watching, you know, there there were three cars. There had been a yeah. wreck. Sorry. There had been a wreck. Yeah. Um, and so she thought, like, that's what I was thinking. I was afraid all night about this thing that didn't happen, that assumed was perfectly safe. And I just feel like that that contrast of everything is great, <laughs> but she's afraid of something that could happen that's horrific because, I don't know, because what? Because she doesn't understand this type of train you know it's the one that goes really fast the rapid day right or i don't know if i'm saying that right yeah uh, i i was very worried about my french in this one i don't speak french so yeah i'll just say it as <laughs> if it's spanish it's the rapid day that's, that's kind of how i said it too <laughs> um and so she'll never go on it again but nothing bad happened here's a right. car crash right that has nothing to do with it so like this idea that this these things that make up her mind of a good husband or not a good husband is just that he's American and there's no evidence to support it where all this evidence mounts on the other side that everything else is just as good or equally as good or better. You know, I don't know. Yeah. But I just thought it was really well crafted. Right. And and then apparently the, uh, the narrator's wife did not agree that American men make the best husbands. So, well, yeah. she's got her own place in Paris now, so <laughs> she's doing all right, I guess. <laughs> Uh, okay, well, that is that story. So let's move on to our next one, an Alpine Idol. 
This one, very briefly, is about two skiers who, in uh, this one's set in Germany, two skiers, uh, John and our narrator. I don't think the narrator's named. I don't remember. And they apparently, I, I guess the way to do things back then was you hiked up the mountain and you stayed in a cabin or a hut mm -hmm. for weeks at a time and just skied for however long. And then, you know, as the snow starts to melt, it gets to be May in this story, you come down out of the mountains and you go do something else. And they're ready to get out of the mountains and stop skiing. Um, personally, you know, I used to ski when I was a kid. And, I mean, you would do it once a week, twice a month maybe. And that was plenty. You I can't skiing all day. I can't imagine. Yeah, all day, every day for... <laughs> weeks at a time uh these guys are are dedicated to skiing well anyway they come down to the mountains they pass a churchyard and they see uh, a funeral they're burying someone in this graveyard they go to the inn to get a drink and in walks the sexton and the priest and the guy who was burying his the it turns peasant. out his wife the peasant yeah and they're talking in german uh, apparently high german or low german these guys only speak you know, high German, which, you know, as a language learner, I can, I can dig, I can relate. Um, but then they, the, the, the peasant leaves, you know, doesn't want to drink, uh, and then, or doesn't want to drink with them. Apparently there's some tension there that he doesn't want to drink with the, after the, paying the for second, everything, the peak. after paying, or after paying. Yeah. He buys everyone's drinks. Right. And so then the innkeeper kind of chats and, and gets the story, and he tells the Americans, hey, you guys got to hear this story. And he calls the, the priest and the sexton over, and he says, hey, hey, tell them tell what you told me. Tell them what you told me. Well, it turns he says out... peasants are beasts. Right, peasants are beasts. beasts. Exactly. So it turns out that the, uh, that the guy, uh, was it Oles? Yeah, Oles. Oles. Yeah. Um, his wife, this is May now, don't forget, his wife died last December, and because it was so snowy up in the mountains, he couldn't get the body out. So he put her in the shed where, you know, she froze and rigor mortis set in. Yeah. But he had put her on top of a stack of logs. Then he needed to get to the logs. So he propped her up against the wall and then um, decided to, to hang his lantern in her jaw. <laughs> and just made her a, a fence post, you know, a, a lantern stand uh, while he could do his work. Um, and then finally could bring her out of the mountains in, in May and... Uh, and barrier and this all gets related because when he brings her to the priest the priest looks at the body and says oh your your wife died in uh, december of um i forget what she died of and it's heart, like, attack. What, heart attack heart what attack what happened what happened to her face and he's like oh well uh, you know let me let me tell you um so anyway so that's kind of the the, the story here and they, they're like they, don't you love her yeah, he's like, I why, love her very much. Why'd you do much. that to her? Yeah, I, he's like, you know what? I loved her fine. Yeah, I loved her fine. I mean, she uh, was dead. She yeah. served good good use as a lantern. Right. <laughs> very practical, this peasant in his, uh, up at his farm. So then uh, he's finished, and uh, John and the narrator go, all right, let's get something to eat. And the story ends. So what did you, uh, what'd you make of this one? <laughs> I mean, I thought, you know, like doing a little very minimal research because I really like to experience these stories just as a reader and right. talking to you about sure. them without too much. But uh, I thought it was very interesting that there is a greeting ski heil in this. Yes. And I looked up, I looked up ski heil and apparently the OED Oxford English Dictionary says Hemingway is the only known usage of ski high. Oh, so, I don't know if this okay. is a thing he made up or he heard. Thought that was interesting. I really. I mean, this is the early, this is the mid twenties, so this is pre, you know, National yeah, Socialist like Party and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So I don't I don't know when they came to power exactly. Thirty uh, two, maybe. I'm not sure. I can't remember. I I don't like. Unless he's making fun of Sig Heil by going ski Heil, if he's if Hemingway is the only one who, because he, I mean, he skewers Mussolini in, you know, our, our previous sections, and now he's maybe he's skewering the Nazis in this one. I don't know, satirizing them. I I don't I don't I mean, 
perhaps Oles has a dark sense of humor and he had to <laughs> didn't know what to do with his wife. He loved her. He couldn't take her anywhere until the snow melted. Yeah. There she is. He doesn't want to look at her. He hangs a lantern from her mouth. I don't know. I just think it's kind of like a Tucker and Dale versus evil kind of comedy, horror comedy. But also, Oles seems quite intentional about it. They're, he's like, yeah. did you do I, it many times? He's like, yeah, every time yeah, I went to shed did. at night. Every time. I found it just as sort of a practicality. Like, he's like, oh, well, she's dead. She can't help on the farm. I still got farm work to do. Well, I'm gonna hang my lantern Be a useful, there. woman. Hold my lantern. <laughs> right. Like, I can't bury her. The ground's frozen. I mean, what am I going to do with her? Well, I guess I'll just, you know, she's dead. What does she care? I get, I mean, you could lay her down and put a blanket over her. I guess, but then she's in the way, maybe? I don't, I mean, I don't know. I've never worked on a German farm in the mountains in the early 20s. So maybe it's just a lot of stuff to do in the, in the shed. I don't know. I don't know. And the innkeeper's like, did you understand it all? Do you understand it all about his wife? And they're like, I heard it. I'm like, I'm with yeah. you. I heard it. I don't totally don't get it. understand it. Well, I think um, this one, you know, a little bit as well from the last story, we had some, you know, sort of racist attitudes. I think here we're seeing some, you know, obviously the peasants are beasts. It's pretty blatant. Sure. But then Oles, I think he he didn't think anything of it. He he did not think it was strange. But after he came down and was talking to the innkeeper and the sexton, and they he he got the vibe that they were making fun of him or did not think that he, like, he didn't think anything of it. But then he didn't drink with them because, I think, because of how they treated him once he brought her down. Yeah. You know, as opposed to just being like, man, I'm sorry, your wife's dead. Let's have a drink, buddy. They're like, you did what? And he's like, well, what else am I supposed to do with her? I mean, I don't know. I, I don't, you know, I don't get the sense that Oles is a beast. Like, that's a pretty strong term. Like, Yeah, I agree. He did some, some like, really... I want to use the word banal, but probably just because <laughs> because the story's coming up. But like some real regular, boring, nothing thing. Yeah, it was not but, malicious. But yet it seems so wrong. Yeah, like, he was not trying to desecrate his wife. He was just like, I don't know what else to do with her. And oh, oh, there's a, I can hang my lantern in her jaw. Okay, it's holding it. <laughs> Maybe she had a really good sense of humor. And he's like, she get a kick out of this. I mean, we don't know. We could this have. This is funny. Yeah, we could have. Uh, the only other thought I kind of had about this one um, was maybe this story also could have served as a travel log, in some respect. You know, mm -hmm. like as we talked about back in in Three Men in a Boat, which is only you mm -hmm. know twenty five or so years earlier than this. You know, people didn't travel much back then, and especially for you know, Hemingway's writing about Italy and, and Spain and uh, Germany and these places that the vast majority of Americans are not going to travel to. Mm -hmm. And he had the, the means and the money to do this. Um, well, we can talk a little bit about his popularity and some little anecdotes that I found on, on that. But uh, he was quite well off as, as my... I mean, he was paid quite well for these books. So he had the ability to, to go to all these exotic places and travel. Um, so I don't know, maybe he's just relating like, oh, this is what the people in Germany were like. You know? Hang lanterns by their wife's Hang jaws. <laughs> exactly. I don't know. All right, so that gets us into, have you got anything else on this one? We can save it for the wrap too. Uh, I don't want to. No, I think that's episode. it. I mean, I like yeah. it. It's these, weird that I like it, though. But these it's... are short stories. I like all of these. I mean, these are yeah. these are short stories. Hemingway's good, man. All right, so that brings us into story number three from this section, A Pursuit Race. And this one, the title, it explains right off the bat that a pursuit race is a... a I didn't... You know, maybe we can... I guess it's neither here nor there. I didn't quite understand how the race worked because mm. you had to... The winner, so anyway, it's a bicycle race where it's with a staggered start. And so if you catch the racer in front of you, that racer is out. And then the winner is the one who has gone the most distance. So I'm not quite sure. Like, I guess the guy in the 
back could technically win somehow if he's gone the most distance and maybe caught a rider or two. And I don't know. The logistics of it, I was trying to figure it out. It didn't quite make sense to me. But metaphorically, this is being used because in, in a couple of ways. Um, literally being used because this guy, William Campbell, is in a pursuit race with a burlesque show. So Campbell is the advance man for this burlesque show. He goes ahead of the show to cities. Ostensibly, I guess he's, he's going to find a venue. He's going to kind of set it up, do some advertising, do some prep mm-hmm. work before the show comes into town, and then he scoots ahead. So he doesn't really want the show to catch up with him. He wants to, to be ahead of the show, getting ready for the next place where it's going to go. Uh, but the show has caught him. He is in um, Kansas City, I believe. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, So it says he's gone from Pittsburgh to Kansas City, and he's in Kansas City, and his boss, also named William, or Billy, uh, has caught up with him, and he's he's in a hotel, and he's kind of sauced, and he's he's drunk, and he's just laying in bed, and he's talking about how great this bed is, and his sheet is wonderful, and he's making love to this sheet, and he (laughs) wants to, he's licking it and kissing it, I mean, it's a little, it's a little, uh, anyway. (laughs) <laughs> it gets, it's gets good a writing weird. of a drunk person. It though. is. It gets a little weird. But then we find out he's not just drunk, but he pulls his sleeve back and he shows Billy a bunch of scars. So he's mm-hmm. back on the juice. Um, I'm guessing heroin. What do we? I would assume with the track marks. Yeah. That's what I thought. Yeah, yeah. It, I don't think it actually says. But um, anyway, that, but that's why he's it... drinking. I think uh, that's what he means by I've got my wolf back. Yes. So the wolf. I've had him for a week. Right. But the drinking yeah. makes the wolf, kicks the wolf out of the room. So that's why he's drinking. Because the drinking yeah. helps bring him down. For a from, little bit anyway. Right. Yeah, from whatever he he's, he's been on. And this, so then the title of the story, The Pursuit Race, this is sort of the metaphorical, is he is in a pursuit race with his own addictions and demons. And now they have caught him and he is going to be out of the race, the race of yeah. life obviously i heard i read one critic even said the story is in its own pursuit race and the story catches up to the metaphor and the metaphor has to get off its bike oh no (laughs) the subtext becomes text where we just go yeah you got caught man yeah Uh, crazy (laughs) yeah because it says you know it catches it so the catching right so Mm -hmm. his boss's name is billy and apparently uh, has a nickname Sliding Billy mm-hmm. because he can slide on by. He can slide through life. And William Campbell says, I can't slide, Billy. I'm not like you, man. It, I get caught. It catches up with me. So he's been sliding all this time, staying ahead of the wolf. You know, he was off the drugs. Uh, but now whatever has happened in, in Kansas City, um, it's caught up with him. And Mr. Campbell, he... You know, he's like, hey, Billy, you know, why don't you, why don't you go to a, you know, a rehab center? You know, they got some cures here. It can, can fix you up. And he's just like, no, no, not going to do it, you know. And I think we, you know, as Amy Winehouse said, they tried to make me go to rehab. And Billy here, William Campbell says, no, no, no. So I think we not gonna see go. how this, this story is going to end. Well, he tells him, he says, you can't just quit at your age and take to pumping yourself full of that stuff because you've got in a jam. He said, there's no law against it, if that's what you mean. No, I mean, you've got to fight it out. And I think he's like, there's like a, you know, Mr. Turner, Billy Turner, the manager is like, you can't just quit life and start taking drugs. You got to figure it out. And he's like, well, but I think. William Campbell, the addict, says, takes it as, well, I can't just kill myself because there's a law against it, if that's what you mean. No, I mean, you've got to fight it out. Like, I, there's so many different levels that these conversations can work on that, like, <laughs> this story is, like, equally sad and silly. Like, him with the sheet, right. licking it, and he's like, I love my sheet. <laughs> This is such a great sheet, and he doesn't want to come out. And he's like, "We well, cut it out with the sheet. Knock it off with the yeah. sheet." Um, and again, the the last line. What did you think of the last line? <laughs> As a guy who 
loves uh, my bed and loves my comforter and my sheets, um, it stuck with me. So the last line that, that Mayor's referring to, he says, uh, when Mr. Turner came up to William, so Mr. Turner says, I'll, I'll come check on you later. Uh, but when he comes up to his room at noon, William Campbell was sleeping. And as Mr. Turner was a man who knew what things in life were very valuable, he did not wake him. So Billy has been uh, William Campbell. That's tough when they're both named William, right? Mm -hmm. William Campbell, the addict, has been running from something and, you know, avoiding using drugs and alcohol. And and now he's sleeping and he's he's peaceful for once. Uh, And so, you know, Mr. Turner lets him sleep and he's like, you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to stay on this guy's case. I'm not going to bug him. And like a lot of these stories, you know, it leaves it open-ended. It's not like, you know, Mr. Turner obviously cares about uh, Campbell. Seems to, yeah. You know, he may come back the next day. I mean, he, because he says, like, he said he's not going to fire him. He said, at the one point, does he say you still have a job? You know, he's got a job to do. Um, you know, because I think Bill, William Campbell was assuming, like, oh, you know, now I'm back at the stuff. You can fire me. You guys go on. I don't, I don't need this job anymore. Uh, but Mr. Turner is not... Not will you know? It says you know he could just. William Turner was a, bu- a busy man. And he had other stuff to do, but he kept standing there. Um, he didn't leave, right? You know, um, Mr. Turner had been in this room much longer than he should have been. He had many things to do, and living in daily association with people who use drugs, which says a lot about the girls he has in his show, he had a horror of drugs, and but he was very fond of William, and he did not wish to leave him, and he was sorry for him. So he he does go, but then he but he comes back. So I don't I don't know. I think maybe maybe Turner is going to stay engaged with uh, Campbell and try to get him clean. I don't know, but at the very least, sleep is valuable and rest is valuable, and I I relate to that. He's also got to find someone else to go ahead of the show and well, advertise. Otherwise, <laughs> he, this is true. You know, get Billy cleaned up enough, just enough that he can yeah. shove him along forward. Um. It's like, I just realized as we were talking, like, a sleep pops up. We're going to talk about another story that has sleep in it. But then in 50 Grand, that character was struggling with sleep. Billy's talking about sleep. Um, we'll get to sleep Hemingway at the end. Hemingway had a... Hemingway had a... Down. Had well, a I think Hemingway knows what's very valuable in life. Um, mm-hmm. I think sleep is... is you know, it is like folks. If you're not getting your seven to nine hours of sleep a night, like that is when your body heals itself. Nine Honestly, hours. that's what you should. I mean, as an adult, you, you really should shoot for it. Unless you're a teenager, I don't know if we've we, we've we've settled the under twenty five debate. But I don't know if we have teens listening to the podcast. Teens, if you're out there, you guys need like twelve hours of sleep a night, man. We like do. sleep a lot, but that's when your brain. Like, it resets your body, and there's so many health benefits to sleep. Like, you need it, you know? You don't have to sell me, man. That's all I want. I know. That's all I want to do, too. That's what I'm doing once the pods are, once we're done recording. That's what I'm doing as well. (laughs) When you have a baby, people are like, oh, you're not going to sleep when they're a baby. Nobody tells you, like, hey, you're not going to sleep very well for the next nine years, and that's it if you have one kid. It's independent of children. If you have a job, you're probably not going to sleep much. Yeah, if you and live in a society. A <laughs> then you've got kids. Then yeah. you've got whatever stress is in your life. And then you, you know, doom scroll at night and you put the blue light oh, in your don't eyes do that. or whatever. Yeah, it's so yeah, bad. Don't, don't do, do that. that. Don't do that. My nemesis is the blue light. Everything, everywhere is dark mode. My whole computer yep. is dark mode. My yep. phone is dark mode. I have blue light filter on all the time. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's, it's just, it is just physically better for you. Yeah. Okay, so let's get to our next one. Uh, Now we've got Today is Friday, and this one is interesting because it's written as a play, and I'm wondering if it was ever performed. I I tried really hard with this one. I didn't want to read it full like, then the first Roman soldier said, then the second Roman soldier said, but I also didn't want to not read it as if it was a play. Right. So judge me if you will, everyone who listened to me read it, but I tried to do like a a narrator voice and 
I didn't do voices because I, I can't really do voices. But I also tried to make it clear that there were three people talking at a time and then a fourth person. So we'll see. But that's how I approached this as, as you know, reading, reading aloud. Um, it made me think of when you guys did a Christmas Carol and one of the actors is actually supposed to be Charles Dickens reading right. to us and the narrator. And he was dressed that way. And I, I thought that was a really clever way. I like that. Like there he is. I can see him reading. He was even like mouthing everyone's lines as if. Right. Here yeah, I am, he did, he did a great job story. with that. That was new this year that he threw that in. That yeah. was really good. It was cool. So anyway. Do you want to do today is Friday? Or do you want me to do it? Uh, I mean, you can you can go ahead and, and take lead. Um, go ahead. I mean, it's pretty simple. It, three Roman soldiers and a Hebrew barkeep they call George. Uh, and <laughs> very Hebrew <laughs> name, traditional. Yeah, super super traditional. <laughs> um, it's eleven o'clock at night. That so the place text tells us, and they're at a drinking place. And they're a little cockeyed. So they're a little buzz, a little drunk, and they've just crucified Jesus. And obviously, since it just happened, Jesus is only who he is during his lifetime. He's not the Jesus of proportion, right, of the day. But you don't really know what's happening. They're just talking about drinking. And have you tried the red? And I don't You've been out here too long. I don't drink this stuff. I don't feel good. And they're just going back and forth and talking. And the third Roman soldier puts down his cup. And, you know, being a modern day person, I read it as an exclamation, like, Jesus Christ. Well, I think that's the point. I, I think we yeah. need to mention that this is written in modern vernacular. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they're not speaking Roman. Latin, you mean? <laughs> Latin, yeah. Italian. They're not speaking yeah. uh, anything of the day. Well, not or... even formal. Like, like he even even the way he writes lieutenant, he writes it L O O, like lieutenant, like Luten very lieutenant Dan. Well, yeah, like, like he's yeah, like yeah. he's from Brooklyn or something, you know, this bartender. Yeah. So I read it that way. Yeah, and and I thought it was a great. I mean, there isn't an exclamation point, but I think I read it with an exclamation point because he makes a face. So exactly. it says the... the um, stage direction. Yeah, stage direction. There we go. Uh, but the second <laughs> soldier calls it, says that false alarm. Yeah. And I was thinking maybe they meant that false alarm. Like, like then they go on to talk about he did, he did all right out there, one of them says. Right, he the did first okay. Guy. And they talk yeah. about... Well, why didn't he come down? Everyone wants to get down. Well, he didn't want to come down. That wasn't his thing, yeah. wasn't his play. And so I'm wondering, like, that false alarm. Well, that, that mean, false that, alarm. Go ahead. Yeah. What, meaning, one, my un thinking, one of two things, like that false alarm, like, we didn't have to make sure he didn't get down, but also we thought maybe something miraculous would happen and he would yeah. get down. Yeah. And so boom, false alarm. You were actually just a person. Yes. So they th are saying that's how I, that's how I read it. Yeah, definitely. Because they're like, he could have come down because that's one of the things um, in the Bible where they say to him, you know, if you're the son of God, why don't you come down off that cross? You know, so, but he's not supposed to, he's not supposed to, well, they don't know that, you know, but he, you know, but by not doing it, cause, but they're like, I've never seen anybody that didn't want to come down. I mean, they say, like, man, everybody wants to come down. Yeah. Nobody wants to stay up there. Like, once we nail them up there and we put them up and every, you know, I mean. Sure. Who doesn't I, want, I mean, I'll climb, yeah. everybody would want to come down. But, yeah. but he says, oh, I don't know. He was pretty good in there today. Yeah. Well, the second like, guy says, anytime you show me somebody that doesn't want to get down off the cross when the time comes, I mean, I'll get, I'll get right up there with him. Because everybody wants to come down when it comes down to it. Of course, they're being crucified. Yeah. But, and, you know, in the Bible, that's right at the end, right before he gives up, you know, he's, Christ says, you know, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which, honestly, that, that you know, is, uh, I don't know, uh, theologically, what that means is at that moment, Christ felt separation from God 
an utter distance from from God. So that's what he was saying. But to a Roman soldier on the ground, he was probably hearing, oh, man, this, this guy's about to die. And he's like, oh, this sucks, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I don't want to be a jerk about anything, but I've like if you're if the Trinity thing is is the thing that Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit, they're all one and the same. And Jesus knew the deal the whole time. He really only had to get through the weekend. Like, his weekend <laughs> was kind of ru ruined, but he knew, like, oh, and then I'm done, and I sit at the right hand, and I'm good. So I have to endure all this, but I'm coming back. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, well, it's I, a that's, crappy weekend, but... Well, that's, I mean, theologically, that's the point of his cry at that moment is because that the trauma and the of the utter separation from god is so profound and so terrible that that not even he could take it like it was it was that bad kind of thing so but then if they're one and the same but but they were set i mean that's a, that's my point is like they were separated that's but at how? that moment i don't know man i'm not god <laughs> separate but equal it's three sep you know we know how well that went. That's that was probably a bad way to say it. But anyway. They are distinct entities, but distinct entities of the same thing. If that, I don't know. Yep, that made more sense. The kid's book uses the apple, right? The skin and the flesh and the core are all parts of the apple, but they're all separate. I don't know. Anyway, whatever. Okay. I don't know. It's fine. I didn't, I didn't anyway. go to seminary. Don't don't uh, in the world of in the world that. of this story. Yes. Nobody in this story knows that. Correct. Or believe that. Correct. And then That's we've the got point. the the instance of George, the Hebrew bartender. Right. And he was not interested in any of this. No, he wasn't. He's was like whatever. And like George is like, I don't even follow it. I'm not interested in it at all. And I guess that's the point. Like, that's the point, the contrast. Sure, yeah. And they they call they call the first soldier. So it seems like the second soldier is like all soldier. Like He's doing his job. The third right. soldier feels sick about it. Right. A at least that's implied. Sure. And then the first soldier keeps saying, like, he's pretty good in there. He seems he, to, like, something, think yeah. there's Gotta... something else. He's like, kid him, but listen, what I tell you, he was pretty good in there today. Yeah. And then the second soldier's like, ah, let's just drink some more. The third one's like, I don't feel so good. Right. <laughs> Is it the second soldier who gave him the, the sword? Uh, which one? Because he did said, it? "You keep doing that, you're going to get no, in trouble." No, it was the first one. It was the first one, because he's he's trying to put him out of his misery. Oh, uh, uh, he's he trying to help. It's the least out. I could do for him. I tell you, he looked pretty good to me in there, you know. So he was trying to like kind of finish him off and and like put him out of his misery. The some of the stuff that I read, they they were like the soldiers are talking about him as as one would talk about a fighter. So you know, Hemingway has this thing with boxing and bullfighting. And he looked pretty good in the ring, yeah. on the cross. Exactly. The, you know. The thing he was doing, yeah. <laughs> Fighting the good fight, yeah. I guess. Um, the second soldier hurls a slur about George. Yeah. Uh, first one says he's a good fella. Sold the third one again. Feels like hell tonight. Yeah. I, just, I just feel like hell. So it's just... And the fact that today is Friday, they've got a couple of days, and then yeah, you know, yeah. it's Good Friday. It's Good Friday. They're not feeling so great about what just happened. Well, the, the third one's not feeling so great. The first one, I think, is just kind of like, yeah. And the second yeah, one doesn't whatever. care. Yeah. Well, no, the yeah. first one cares. He cares. He was one. he was touched by it. Like it it affected yeah. him. Yeah. The second one is like doesn't care. The second yeah. one doesn't even want to pay because, you know, payday's Wednesday, George. Yeah, Today's exactly. Friday. Come on, man. <laughs> what the hell, George? Today, Wednesday's payday. Uh, I know that feeling, too. Right? Come on, man. Who gets paid on Wednesday? <laughs> hey, take it up with Caesar, all right? 
Uh, okay, so that's uh, we're over time on that one. So let's go on to uh, oh. B- banal story. Well, I have to shut my door. Oh, okay. Fat, the fat cat came in and opened it. Oh dear. All right, so this one. Um, you wanna you wanna start this one as well, or it's it was interesting to me. Oh, she's she's gone. So I guess this is the part of the video I will have to cut out. So I will. I will pause and restart us, and I will just, uh, if you're watching the video, I don't know, maybe I'll leave this in. This is, I'll just riff for a second. I'll cut this out of the podcast, so this is just a, a bonus for YouTube, you, uh, you a bonus, I'm definitely <laughs> cutting this now, a bonus for you hardcore YouTube subscribers. Uh, so hey, like and subscribe down below, hit the little bell for notifications, all that stuff, I'll say that again stand up. Exactly. I see Mayor stand up. <laughs> What? That's what brings it in. I'm gonna put that on the thumbnail. That's what that's all bring in the clicks. All right, so let's go back. I'm gonna do a snap here for our, our podcast. All right, snap it. All right, uh, YouTube folks. Um, all right, we're gonna get back on this. Okay, so that brings us to banal story. Do you say banal banal? It's banal, right? I said banal because yeah, I didn't okay. want to say anal on the podcast. Banal. It's banal. banal. It's banal. I think it's banal. <laughs> it's banal. It is banal. banal. It is banal. <laughs> Uh, so this one was very interesting because it starts out with just sort of a lot of random stuff, uh, you know, advertisements and uh, sort of an article in a magazine and writings. And it's talking about it's talking a lot about uh, the future and and what what are, you know, this magazine, the forum is like going to have all the new writers and who's going to be the the next uh, James Joyce, who's going to be the next President Coolidge, uh, you know, what's going to, who's going to be the next great explorer, discover the world. And then you find out that the person reading uh, the book, or the pamphlet, booklet, is uh, Manuel Garcia Meera. And, spoiler, Manuel Garcia is the same, it's our boy Manolo, I think. It's the same name. It's, it's our boy Manolo. That's not who's undefeated. reading it. Sure it is. It is not. Manuel, because look, come on. He's a bullfighter, and his name is Manuel Garcia. Okay, <laughs> it's well, fine. Same, it's the same guy. But that's not the person who's reading the magazine. Who was reading the magazine? I think just the narrator, the writer. I'm imagining it says, Hemingway. It says he laid down the booklet. And meanwhile, stretch flat on a bat. Oh, okay. Well, maybe. I guess yeah. it could be a separate person. It is. I I took it. Well, I so you took it as this guy who's lying in his bed with tubes in his lungs, dying of pneumonia, is yeah. reading this magazine. Oh no, he's not. You're in? right. Uh, he, so the first line. So he ate an orange, slowly spitting out the seeds. Outside, he reached for another orange. Okay. Yeah. So there's some other guy reading the magazine. Okay. And while he's reading it and just kind of seeing all this frivolous stuff in the magazine, back in uh, in Spain, Manuel Garcia is laying with a tube in each lung, drowning yeah. with, with pneumonia. Um, and he's, he's, spoiler, he dies the next page or whatever. Uh, but all the papers had special supplements to his death. Um, people were buying pictures of him. It says bullfighters were very relieved to be dead. Uh, bullfighters were very relieved he was dead because he did in the bullring things they could only do sometimes. He did always in the bullring the right. things they could only do, do sometimes. sometimes. Right. And I if we remember, in the first story in The Undefeated, Retana said that Manuel used to bring him in. He did used right? to. Right? Until he got hurt, and then he tried to make his comeback, and Manuel and Retana was like, man, you, you don't bring him in like the new guys do anymore. Like, your time is, is over, Manuel. Um... All right. So, so I just you thought think it was it's a nice book. Manuel. Oh, it has to be. It's Manuel Garcia. It's the same. It's the same Manuel. And he's a bullfighter. Mm-hmm. How many? Right. How many? Uh, granted, Manuel well, Garcia okay. is like saying Bob Smith, but <laughs> you know, he's also Johns a bullfighter. Could there possibly be? I know. But he's also a bullfighter. So how many bullfighters named Manuel Garcia are there going to be? I don't know. I think it's Manolo. Well, I, I really like this. This. I try to read it like. A frivolous, not frivolous, but like an advertisement voice. Yes. Like, are you a girl of 18? 
<laughs> take the case of Joan of Arc. Take the case of Bernard Shaw. Take the case of Betsy Ross. But then he, there's these meanwhiles or these far away, these fighters or these sports people. They talk about the cricketers. And he's like, there was romance. There was romance like Danny Frush was knocked cuckoo in the second round in far off Mesopotamia. The snow had this immense amount of snow had fallen in Australia. Cricketers were doing this. And then in comparison, there's this banality or this frivolousness of the forum and this kind of writing. And you know, and then this thing about Manuel and him dying, but then also they got many colored pictures of him and they rolled them up and put them away in their pocket and then they never looked at them again. Dot, you know, dot, dot, dot. Yeah. They rolled them up and never looked at them again and the full length colored pictures of him to remember him, but lost the picture they had in their memory because, which is actually quite true because our memories sometimes are only memories of the last time we had the memory the oh last yeah time we thought memories of it. change memories can change yeah dude memories i have such valuable. i have such strong memories of being in a place having a conversation and i did not live in that place but my memory is i'm on the phone in a house <laughs> that i did not live in when i'm having that conversation <laughs> you might want to and it makes a no paranormal sense paranormal investigator check that out <laughs> well i had the conversation but I just lived some, like, it couldn't have happened in the place where I didn't live. But sure, my brain you can change, like, you can picture things in your mind, yeah. Yeah, and I've got, like, a quote-unquote clear memory of this conversation Yeah. taking place in somewhere I lived two years later than when the conversation actually occurred. This is why eyewitness testimony is unreliable in court, but, you know, whatever. Yeah, <laughs> but, like, this, the idea that, I feel like the romance is lost for me. It's lost. The idea that you lose, I feel like it's so prescient. Is that the right word? It's so today. It's so now I've got 20,000 photos in my cloud oh, my storage, yeah. you know? Yeah. But the pictures that I have of myself as a kid where mom's got like two or three from this age, two or three from this age. And there, it's like Christmas, Easter, Christmas, Easter, Halloween, Christmas, Easter, Halloween. <laughs> it's like, yeah. you took pictures at special occasions. And then every now and then, if there was film in the camera, you get these candid shots. I've got like 17 candid shots of the same five minute <laughs> section. And sometimes you can watch I'm your, like- your arm move slowly as you've taken <laughs> six pictures of the same thing. I'm like, I sometimes try to put my phone away and then there's this battle of, but I really want a picture of whatever this is. And I'm like, but I also just want to watch it. I just want to have a memory, not my memory as seen through my phone. Screen. Well, I didn't read it yet. I didn't read the article yet. It's going to get even worse with AI nowadays, but uh, I didn't read the article, but I did see a headline the other day about how much, like what does photography even mean anymore? Because mm. how much of, because our phones, we don't even know it. There's so much, like, embedded, for lack of a term, better term, AI, but processing and editing that automatically happens with the phone, with the digital photography. So how much is actually the image and how much is the phone kind of maybe tweaking and correcting things? Um, and really? if you've seen, yeah, and if you've seen, like, iPhone commercials where they will show you, like, people walking on the beach and then the person's like, eh, and then he edits, you know, just automatically edits out mm. all the other people. Like it's a, f it becomes a false memory because now you have this picture of you and your spouse or whomever walking yeah. on this empty beach when really it was full, but you know, it was not an empty yeah. beach, but in your memory now it's going to become this beautiful empty beach that you've created or, you know what I mean? I like, so what does photography mean? What does memory mean? I, um, I fight with my, myself yeah. with that. Like I don't, I take away the filter. Zoom is like correct appearance. I'm like, no, don't right. yeah. correct my appearance because sure. yeah. I don't want to have a false image of my own self. I look at myself a lot because I'm always in Zoom, and I'm just I'm, I can see myself right now. Yeah, but I'm also flipped. Like my hair looks like it's 
Sure, it's uh, mirror. It looks yeah, like it's, it's on this side, but it's not. Right. It's on <laughs> whatever. <laughs> I look at myself a lot, but that's because I'm vain. Um, wow. Well. <laughs> <laughs> but then also, like you said, like pictures, like I'll take something and I'm like, oh, God, I wish it w didn't look like this. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to edit this because this is just what it is. And right. I don't want to do what you're saying. I don't want to. You know, if I didn't get the picture, I didn't get the picture. Or if someone's weirdness is in the background, fine. Yeah, exactly. Kind of makes you're gonna fun. Hang it, maybe if you're going to hang it on your wall, because that's always been true. Yeah. That photographers will edit for like something that's going to be a portrait, which then I feel like that's different. I guess if it's staged. It yeah, if it's staged, it's one thing as yeah. opposed to, yeah. There's only been one moment in my life where I very deliberately did not take a picture because I wanted to retain the mental image in my mind. And when I think, Simon was born? No, when no, when I graduated and we uh, we did the hat toss. Like I had oh. a dispose I had a disposable camera with me and I just I intentionally went, "No, I'm going to throw my hat and I'm going to look up in the sky." And I'm just going to savor the mental image. I'm not going to worry oh, about that. trying to get a picture and looking at it through a, a lens or through a camera. Because, and especially now with phones and the phone cameras being so prevalent, you know, I think a lot of people experience life through their screen. Oh yeah. And they're they're not actually seeing things. So that that's the one time I was. Of course, that's back in the day when you had to be judicious, a little bit more judicious about. Um, how many shots you had on a camera, you know, your disposable camera, 20 pictures or whatever. But that's the one time that I very deliberately said, I'm not going to take a picture. I'm going to just, I'm going to savor this memory and this mental image in my mind. Yeah. So. I, I think on the flip side of that, like, I, I think that's beautiful. Like, I, I would err on that side more often than not. I also, we're having this experience if I've set up like the ambient, TV picture when the TV's just not on. Mm. Well, it's on, but like we were casting and now the Chromecast just has like nature scenes on sure. it or sure. something. I set it up to play uh, a couple different albums from my photos. And so we get to experience memories that we have fully forgotten. Uh, like, yeah. oh, that was that, that place. Picture. Sure. We did that, and remember, oh, remember yeah. when the kids look like that? And half the time, Ben and I are like crying by the yeah, of course, <laughs> end of the night. <laughs> and then the kids, when the TV goes off, they're they see these pictures that they've never seen of themselves, and they're like anticipating when it flips and where is that and when was that and who is that? And it's like this cool little moment of like where before you'd have to go get the photo album and take sure. it out, and the pictures yeah. would always be the same on the same page. And so there's this experience of like being able to share that, which is one way where you create one way to create connection with family and with kids is sitting next to them and talking about pictures and memories and saying, you know, telling them about themselves and those kinds of things. So I think that is a good that comes from that. Although I really want to try to experience my life without the screen. Right. Yeah. But yeah, yeah there's definitely positive and, and negatives to, to technology. And like your situation or your example, you could get a picture of the hat toss that anywhere online and it would look pretty similar to what right. you it's saw. Right, it's not my hat toss though. You know, you know, it's, right. yeah. And it's not from you, my perspective looking up and seeing right, all the hats. Right, which is the valuable you know, thing, I think. Somewhere in that mess is my hat and, you know, yeah. But if you wanted to know, I wonder what the hat toss, like you could find the hat toss, sure. but you could never find, like that's special for you. Right. And just that the feeling personal of personal memory. Yeah, and, and it, it's more than just having that picture. It, like it, it attuned me to the moment, and so like everything, just like that clarity and the sound and the, just everything you know, all the feelings around it. Like you know what that looks like. So the feeling of Al Gore's palm in your palm. <sighs> the feeling of his <laughs> spittle in his mouth as he's congratulating me. Yeah, that was. They should have given poor Al some water, but he's getting through, you know, a thousand handshakes in a, in, in that 20 a lot minutes. Of handshakes. So a lot of handshakes. In a post-COVID world, I'm like, Ugh. Nine, 950 or however many there were. I don't don't touch my hand. Anyway, oh, okay. anyway, anyway, so now, uh, so now we're going to finish off our last story, Now I Lay Me. Oh, um, 
maybe it's not the same Manuel Garcia, because Manuel Garcia's brother's name was Antonio, and in this story they say they're going to bury him next to Joselito, so I don't know, maybe it's could be a different Manuel. Unless that's his kid, unless Manuel had a kid named Joselito who preceded Jose, him in death. Jose, little Jose, Joselito. Yeah, preceded him in death, I don't know. <clears throat> anyway, um, but I, th- I just think it's, you know... Uh, it's cool to think that. Hey, if I had a nickel every time Hemingway wrote a story about a bullfighter named Manuel Garcia, well, I'd have two nickels, but it's kind of funny that it happened twice, right? <laughs> as, the, as the meme goes. All right, so All now right. we go to Now I Lay Me, our last story, and this one is... All about PTSD, one of our favorite topics. You want to take that one, though? Oh, you want me to do this one? No, you, you can do this one. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll get into it next episode, but a lot of this revolves around World War I. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, Hemingway had some very personal experiences with that. So, uh, yeah, so why don't you, we've got uh, two guys in this story that, who are sleeping or trying to sleep. And they can't, so they kind of sit around and talk. And I'll let you take it from there. Yeah, so the it starts with the first guy who's listening to the silkworms eating uh, their, their mulberry leaves. And he's talking about how he can't sleep. And he doesn't want to because if he shuts his eyes in the dark and lets himself go, his soul will leave his body. And he's got this, what I imagine is a really horrific feeling and horrific fear. I, I cannot fall asleep and let this happen. He does sleep, but not in the dark. So he can't sleep um, without you know, it being light. He doesn't want his soul to go out of his body. And it's a really great effort not to sleep. And he goes through all of these mechanisms, which are actually quite beautiful, <laughs> I thought, and actually would put put me to sleep. Yeah. Um, but he, he fishes every single river, lake, stream from his childhood, and then ones that didn't even exist, but he does it so often that now they exist. And sometimes he goes and looks for them, and he's like, oh, wait, I made that one up. <laughs> like, he <laughs> thinks he could actually find these um, these lakes and, or these um, streams and rivers that he fishes up and down the stream, and he'd go back uh, and... Some nights he can't fish. And then he would says he lays awake. He says his prayers over and over. And then he prays for all the people he has ever known. Ever known. Yeah. And that takes up a great amount of time if you ever need to stay awake. Again, I think this would put me to sleep. Thinking of all the people I've ever known. Um, and it brings him to a memory of the attic, uh, of the house where they lived. And this strange memory of his parents they just burned everything? I guess there was no, like, college honks hauling junk back then. You just burn <laughs> you just everything. Burn stuff, yeah. I guess. Um, and there's all these jars in the attic of snakes and specimens, but the alcohol <laughs> evaporated. And eventually when they move, they burn all those. And he remembers what it sounded like when the alcohol, like, caught and the glasses popped and everything. So his mom, he says, was always cleaning to make a good clearance, which I'm not, I've never heard that word used that way before, just but to just to make room. Out. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah. So his dad's away on a hunting trip and his mom burns a bunch of stuff that they quote unquote don't need. And his dad comes home and he's like, what's, uh, what's all this? She's like, I've been cleaning out the basement, dear. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like, I mean, Susan's never burned everything. No. But if she cleans but out. She, she cleans she out. Be, yeah. 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 Um, and he tries to salvage some stuff. He takes some stuff out. His dad like doesn't seem to react, Nick. Re- mu- Nick doesn't seem to react much he's like nick get a rake yeah well, um, men were more stoic back then men were men right they didn't show emotion no but i mean also <laughs> it wouldn't be strange if he's like and then he hauled off and he punched my mom in the face well i kind of I was then we got sort a rake. Of half expecting that with him having the yeah. gun in his hand <laughs> you know? it was a little but everyone is so calm like mom i i didn't get that this is a totally normal thing i felt like this like 
she didn't think this would have the effect on him that it did, I guess. On Nick or on the husband? On the husband. Like, because she was just like, ah, I've been cleaning. I don't, I don't think she was like, you know, sticking it to him. She's like, oh, no, I've been doing some cleaning. And he was just like, he's like, Nick, go get, go get a paper. Take the stuff in the house. And and he like tried to salvage. And a rake. Yeah. Arrowheads and all the best arrowheads had gone to pieces, he right. said. Um. But anyway, so he's got this memory. He shares that. And then he's like, on some nights, though, I can't even remember my prayers. So he tries to pray for everyone. And, he, and some nights he cannot. And he has to start all over. It's it's interesting. He says, I could only get as far on, on as on earth as it is heaven. And then I have to start all over again and be absolutely unable to get past that. I wonder if that, when I read this, I thought, on earth as it is in heaven is so unlikely and so would be so wonderful you know if heaven is a place on earth <laughs> oh, come on you know what it's worth but like he can't get past that phrase because they say in heaven that love comes first you know But for this guy, his PTSD, really, he's been through hell on earth. Yes. Probably quite literally. And for the idea of like, I'm saying this prayer now, on earth as it is in heaven is just like a slap in the face, unfair, so overwhelming an idea or a desire that he can't even get past it. Yeah. I, I mean, this this story has so much going for it so many things you it's you beautiful could, you could probably I'm do an so hour sad. on this story alone oh my god i mean obviously yeah. we have ptsd right where for this sure. guy is like just trying to do anything he can and and you know i was not in world war one obviously uh you know it was really bad because he says they could hear the line like they, so they're not that far for the front line so they they hear the active fighting going yeah. on while they're trying to sleep and, um, you know, I've had, I've had the, the sleeping trouble, you know, back in 2003 and four, like I, I can relate to the not being able to sleep and you're just trying to figure out some way to sleep. But beyond just that, which that's sort of the text, right? Uh, I, you know, memory, you know, this story is really a story about memory, I think. And, you know, cause, cause to, con to combat his PTSD, he tries to remember things, right? Mm -hmm. And as we were saying, memory is malleable. You know, one of the things I've really found interesting, one of the things he tries to remember is all the street names in Chicago mm -hmm. that he could think of. But I don't think he's ever been to Chicago. Because he says to, to John, he says, you know, when they're chatting, he says, tell me about Chicago. He's like, oh, I already told you about Chicago. He's like, tell me again. So I don't think he's even ever been to Chicago, but he's trying to remember all the streets in Chicago. So he's, it, he's making it up like he makes up streams. Like, he's oh, creating, this yeah, street, he's creating this memories. third street in Chicago, and it catches up with Maple sure. Avenue. Like, he's just make, <laughs> making sure. it up. Yeah. Um, or, and the, uh, the other thing with memory is, like, why do we save things? And what do we save? And, like, what is important to our memories? Because, you know, he talks about his grandfather's house having these formaldehyde jars of, of animals and like why did his grandfather have these things these specimens mm -hmm. and then when his grandfather dies it, it has no meaning to them they just throw it out right and then the mom all this stuff in the basement has no meaning to her so she just throws it out burns it it burns it and but the dad is like trying to get these arrowheads like why like he has a shotgun Right? So it's not like a practical, mm -hmm. you know, it's, oh, all the best arrowheads are, you know, all gone to peace. Like, it's not like he needs the arrowheads for hunting, but there's some reason he is saving these arrowheads, right? Like, why? Why do we, why do we save that? Um, I mean, I picture who, who collects arrowheads, children who have time to go out and I'm, sure. I'm picturing like how he's going out fishing and in, in the streams and just spending beautiful, idle time it's not idle, but it's like, you don't have a purpose. You're just a kid outside. 
Yeah. You're, and if you live near a stream joint. or a creek or, you know, you live near good nature, like that is just, I love it. Yeah. I mean, I spent so much time in trees as a kid <laughs> or just on my bike, like doing nothing, finding cool rocks. I had a big shoebox yeah. full of rocks. I was like, this rock looks like a knife. I'm going to go find more knife rocks. Yeah. <laughs> like, these are his knife rocks. These are yeah. these are the arrowheads he found as a kid, I, I'm assuming. Probably. I, Probably. That's more I, likely. Or maybe his dad took him out and they would hunt them together. And he had, could be memories yeah. of his dad doing that with him. Tell him these are the good ones. And right. These ones aren't so good. And now, now all the good ones are gone. And it's like parting with parting with things isn't just parting with things it's it's parting with that a, a tangible memory right almost like it has right. some sort of power like i don't i don't keep every like piece of art my kids do far from it but there's these not to knock it but there are these sites and apps where you just take a picture of the art and then you right. can get it in a flat book and i'm like no i don't want it's if i'm gonna same. keep it right. i'm gonna keep it exactly exactly and and if i'm not gonna keep it i'm also not gonna put it in a book where it's flat and the texture's not there and the dried glue isn't there or the handwriting <laughs> i can't feel you know what i mean right no so, exactly yeah I've, I've saved stuff that my kids have done that they don't know that i've saved and yeah yeah you... i mean i remember coming across stuff that mom saved and like finding letters from first grade, kids wrote me birthday cards. And I'm like, <laughs> oh my God, like my best friend in first grade, here's my birthday card from her. Right. Yeah. Like that's way cooler than having it in a flat book. Yeah. Exactly. Also, I didn't know that it existed. So if it had been burned, yeah, whatever, it wouldn't have, I wouldn't yeah, have right, known. It have, right. It wasn't that important to you, but, but obviously these arrowheads, know. right. He yeah. knew those arrowheads were there. Like he specifically, as soon as he saw the, fire he's like all right go go get my stuff you know uh i had similar it, i mean fight these battles all the time with the amount of stuff that i have kept but when we first took all the stuff out of the basement when we moved mom and dad and i took over all of my stuff that had been in the basement forever there was definitely moments i mean the boys were younger back then and there were moments of them going through my stuff and finding things and breaking things and mm. you know i said like i was able to keep these things nice for 35 years and they didn't survive two minutes of first contact with my sons and just highlighting the difference between my boys and i and um you know that had to... you were a different kind of kid i was i mean I... your stuff didn't survive contact with me for five minutes no it did not and that's why you had a whole separate part of the house I wasn't allowed to go into because exactly. the moment oh. I went into it I broke all your stuff <laughs> and I it. was like it's so unfair oh. I can't play up here but then it's well, like well this is broken reason. and now this is broken and now this is exactly. locked exactly quit breaking my stuff <laughs> oh. anyway yeah so again another another great great story um, any other thoughts on now I lay me I just think it's a beautiful story. It's almost too complex to talk about in certainly in eight minutes. Yes. Um, we're, we're over, but yeah, that's fine. But again, we've got this idea we're reading a, and we'll save it for the wrap, but we're talking about a book called men without women and marriage comes up often. And in this one, the, um, the other guy wants him to get married. Oh, that's right. And, yeah. We didn't mention that. Yeah. And, you know, the other guy's got a wife, he's got kids. Um, and he came to the hospital to see him in Milan in Milan several months. And they, he was very disappointed I had not yet married. Yeah. <laughs> and he was very he, certain he knew it would fix everything. If I just yeah, got married. He's like, everything would, yeah. I knew we would feel badly if he knew that so far I have never married. If we contrast this with the other story set in a hospital of convalescing soldiers where mm -hmm. the major just lost his wife. He tells the the point of view character. I can't remember his name. Like don't get don't. married because you, you can lose your marriage, you know? So anyway, Whew. all right. <sighs> well, that brings us to the end of this one, folks. Next episode, we are going to wrap up uh, the book in total and kind of talk about maybe some more of these themes that have weaved 
have been woven, I guess, have that weave their way, wend their way through the multiple short stories uh, and tie all these stories together. Uh, but if you like what we're doing here, folks, uh, we ask you, please like and subscribe. Uh, we have our podcast feed. You can find us on all major podcasting platforms. Tell a friend about us. You know, that's how we get more listeners. Give us a, a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Say something nice about the podcast. How'd you find it? That helps folks find the podcast as well. You can also go to our YouTube channel where we have all of our discussion episodes and the books as well. I don't know if you like to listen to audiobooks on YouTube. I guess some people do. Uh, I prefer to carry it around with me in a, in a podcast format, but we have all the books organized in handy playlists. So if you just want to listen to one book instead of hunting through a podcast feed, we've got all the books in a playlist, books and discussions all together there on YouTube. All these discussion episodes are on video up there on YouTube as well. So like and subscribe us on YouTube and hit that notification bell so you know when new episodes come out because if you've been around for a while, you know that we don't have a quite regular release mm. schedule because, uh, you know, we are people with lives and jobs and families and whatnot. But we get these out um, whenever we can, and, it, and it's all good. So this wraps up this book. Next episode, we're going to have a new Tasty Treat, new book ready for you. And uh, with that, I will say uh, it is... Daylight savings time this past weekend. I am still jet lagged and tired and headachy. I do not like daylight savings times. This is going to be my curmudgeon y rant. It should be standard time all year Old long. Man yells at cloud. Exactly. <laughs> Europe gets it right. Well, parts of Europe get it right. Uh, parts of the rest of the world know what's up. Abolish daylight savings time. All right. I'm done. <laughs> I like it. I feel great. Peace. <laughs>